So welcome everybody to another Water Stories webinar. This week we've got David Spicer, Earthworks guru extraordinaire, who I'm really excited to talk with about earth surgery, about making these earthen interventions to help restore and repair our water cycle. Um, yeah, David's got a wealth of experience, a huge background designing and implementing projects, getting his hand in the dirt, doing projects all over the world. And so I'm really excited to speak with you today, David. Oh, thanks, Mike. It's a, it's a really it's a pleasure, and you know, I um <clears throat> highly respect what you do, Zach, and you know I love the fact that you talk about the hands because the hands tell the story, and uh, you know it's it's crucial for to get on the ground. You know, I always say design to reality because it's so easy to do pretty pictures, but when you hit the ground and start setting it out then it always doesn't work that way and you need to be adaptable. Yeah. So um, yeah, getting on the ground is crucial. I totally agree. It's so important. And if we're really going to serve the landscapes we're working in, we need to do it in touch with those landscapes. And so that's not from mm. the model. It's not from the map. It's from walking around in reality. Um, so I really, really love and appreciate your approach there. I wonder, maybe we just get into a little bit of the subject of hands. I know it's something we, we've spoken a lot about and how really, you know, these are our assets. These are what we can make mm. and manifest and create with. Mm. I find that the more I do, the better and better of a designer I become because I see mm. the flaws in my early designs as I implement them. I see, you know, how things evolve. I wonder if you could speak to some of the things you've you've seen or learned that you would only gain through implementing? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. I, I think uh, particularly that, you know, I'm from a, from a permaculture background um, and permaculture has a connotation, a heavy connotation of going swale, swale, swale. And I think that's, uh, I was certainly guilty of that at the start. And I think just by experience um, and, and, working with the site over time that I've realized it, we can simplify um, that swale swale approach to more of a often one th one theme through the center of the landscape or something up high you know um, but just to try to impose that concept of thinking we need to go swale 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 to impound that water um, I think Often I'm looking at access and access is not great with swales. Um, and therefore I've gone into a more of a terraced form as you do um, because it's easier to manage. So that's something that's evolved over time is, is adjusting the form. It still functions like a swale, still sits on contour, um, but it's a form that is more workable for people. So certainly over time um, that's become apparent to me, yeah. I love that. That's one of the things that caught my eye early on uh, when I saw you doing that, just because I feel the same way. I, I oftentimes tell people, you know, I'm sure swales work on a landscape. I just haven't seen the landscape where I would personally do it because mm. just not understanding where do you access on a swale? Are you accessing on the berm yeah. where the trees are? Are you accessing in mm. the ditch where mm. the water is? Mm. Whereas with the terrace, mm. it seems like it's a more malleable landform in terms of even a row farmer, if they come across a landscape that's terraced, they can see, okay, I could grow crops on these mm. rows. Um, whereas I often think a lot of these permaculture projects, if they go into the hands of someone else, the first thing they're gonna do is bulldoze everything flat to be able to get equipment <laughs> through. Um, and so, yeah, I, I found the same thing that, and you know, I think it's also about just constantly adapting what we're doing to both the people in the place where we're working. Totally, mate. I, I think that that's a critical point as well, and something that I suppose I pride myself on a bit is is blending approaches. You know, like I'm a, I'm a big believer in Darren Doherty's work from Rigarians, as I'm primarily working that broadacre landscape. Um, but also Peter Andrews work from the natural sequence farming, you know, so just having these concepts, like almost on the peripheral of my mind, yes, my main focus is 
people and, and pattern on our landscape to marry them to the site, but there's a lot of elegance in them two other approaches that I try to blend in. And each site is different. Each client is different. Um, and, and really, I, I often say to people, I, I generally just design a basic mainframe design because you can always do more, you know, but if you can just get them basic elements in place, then it functions and then you can add the layers after, after you start working the site and, you know, establishing speed, tree species or whatever, but you can just start working on that simple theme. It's one of, the, one of the funny things I find really blocks people is fences. Fencing is a real mental blocker for a lot of people. They go, oh, hang on, there's a fence there. And you go, you just cut the bastard. But they can't, <laughs> they can't see past it. It's true. Absolutely. It's true, Absolutely. You know? I see yeah. the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that blending approach is, I think, is critical, really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's so important because in these different contexts, different approaches work best. Like I know a project mm -hmm. we've both know of and seen the, the pro work of Rajendra in India, where they're actually mm -hmm. trying to put the water in the ground to find the seams mm -hmm. that aren't mm -hmm. permeable and sink mm -hmm. it as quickly as possible so the sun doesn't take it away. So it's, you know, from the surface level, it might look like the exact same thing, but these nuances are very different. And mm -hmm. that really comes down to the context of the place, the climate, the goals. There are all these factors that are easy to overlook when, especially when you're just getting started. Mm -hmm. I love that you you're brought getting... the kind of mainframe concept because I find I do the exact same thing. I saw, especially early on, people make these beautiful permaculture master plans and they're just like pages and pages of beautiful artwork. But in a way, I think it's almost saying we have total control over nature. It's kind of this mentality of mm -hmm. control saying, I know what's going to be growing in 10 and 50 years. Mm -hmm. I find like you, it's much better to get the thing going in the right direction and then let it guide you as well. So that, you know, you're not going to know every plant that's going to be growing everywhere right at the beginning. And if if you did, you would be making mistakes because you'd put things in the wrong location that nature is going to tell you like, oh, that fig tree actually wants to be on this side instead of this side, but you're not going to know that at the beginning of the process. In, indeed, mate. You know, uh, for me, you know, Bill Moss, and I had the great pleasure of working for Bill, and uh, he, he always said, um, let your site demonstrate its evolution. Um, so go out and plant 100 tree species around your, your immediate area and let them demonstrate what species work best in that environment and then take them out on scale instead of force and function. You know? uh, Absolutely. I think that's critical. So Yeah, Sepp has taught me the exact same thing. Nature knows what wants to grow where. We, we don't know. We can guess, but nature knows. And mm. if we just set it out and let nature resolve it, it's often mm. the path of least resistance. Totally, mate. And that's where I think that the access element is really important in design because we need to design sites, you know, that people can interact with. You don't interact, you don't observe. And to me, that's, and I, I presume for you, observation is key, you know. It's how, how we make our decisions by our observation skills. And, and having that, that access to me is critical to observe and then develop uh, the plan over time. You know, so I'm looking at Seth's beautiful work behind you. And, you know, for me, it's all accessible. You can meander through them paths. That's beautiful. You know, it's elegant and, and it's enjoyable, you know. And it and draws the person out into the landscape. Because you can enjoy it. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I know one thing we were talking about just before we opened up the call is how sometimes these connections, you know, just one line across a landscape can sometimes really open up a site in terms of mm -hmm. water flow, in terms of access, in terms of observation and connection. What are some of the good examples of that you've seen? Well, I think 
for me, um, it, because I've been primarily working in that sort of broad acre theme, it's the gradient roads that I really like. Um, so that's a road with a slight fall on it, just enough to run water um, into a dam. Um, but to me, that depending on the context of the side, but to me, a, a gradient road really works well because it can give you water in the mid slope so you can gravity feed below that. Um, and you only need a small rain event to actually recharge that dam um, <clears throat> from the road, which is great in Australia in, in dry climates. Um, and, and it gives you access to interact, you know, and observe. So I, that's what I think, like a, a gradient road or a terrace, um, but some sort of theme of access and you know we go water access structures so every bit of access has a relationship to water if we can't design it without that relationship if it, if we do we know we're going to be in trouble um so it has a relationship and and then then it's all about that connection you know um because it gives you that interaction yeah yeah so, sort I, of that, you're what I what I'm looking at now. Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Oh, David, we I generally if I'm if I'm working from the the top to the bottom, um, you know, I'll put put something just off the top of the ridge, something through the mid slope, and maybe something down the bottom, maybe. But, you know, that through the, that mid slope is really where I'm, I'm working because it's a, the path of least resistance. If you get something through that mid slope, you've got all that water coming from the top and you manage it and then you can do what you want with it when it comes down to the bottom. Yeah, you're speaking my exact language there. There's just so many functions that get stacked on in a feature like that. That gradient road, that access terrace, it's given us rainwater harvesting, you know, it might even double or triple the catchment area to our water bodies. It's giving us access ways in between mm. those areas, giving us cultivation areas on the side. It does so much with just one simple little carved feature across the landscape. Mm. Yeah, I Indeed, wonder on, on that theme, if we can speak just a little bit about getting started. You know, a lot of people in here are going to be probably closer to the beginning of their career as an earth worker than, mm -hmm. than the mid or the end. Um, what, what do you recommend to people who ask you, hey, David, how do I get started doing what you're doing? What are my paths into this? Um, well, I think one of the first things would be is understand the surveying and what is level when you, when you talk about level. But surveying because once you once you can survey the landscape, then you you can start that sort. You once you survey it, then it dictates a pattern. And once you've got that pattern, it's just an adjustment up or down where that pattern sits. But once you've got that, then you can actually see. Uh, you know, a lot of my work. I'm not not a great designer in in making it pretty, but I'm more creative. So a lot of the stuff that I create. So sort of the form comes together when I'm doing it. It's an expression. Um, but surveying is always going to anchor me back to reality. I can create what I want as long as it comes back to reality of them heights I'm working with. So that's critical. You know, that's, I, I say to people, no offence to not discrediting the creator, but I say to people, young people who are working with earth movers, laser levels, God, no one can argue with this one because if it's either on or it's off, you know, they can't argue, you know, up or down, you know, um, and it gives them power, you know, over a, a 20 ton machine, you know. Um, I think so understanding, understanding surveying, I think is really, really critical. Um, it's not rocket science uh, at all. Um, and then I think, actually putting a bit of effort in by hand because there's no different um, working with earth with a shovel or an excavator. Uh, yeah, you're picking up a bit more material and moving it, but you're still 
often you're still removing the topsoil, you know, you, you're going through your subsoils and your clay, you know, it's still it's all a process. And you actually learn a lot by doing that with by hand because you get to really experience soil texture, you know. You drive a shovel in and then that sheen comes up on the back of the shovel, or, you know, where you cut and, oh, that's good clay there because that sheen comes up. You know, it's very tactile, your experience, the smell, the sight. So it's really critical to, to put a bit of effort in, you know. Um, small scale is fine to start with. Build your confidence up. And it com comes back to levels because once you've got the levels right, then... It doesn't matter whether it's a kilometre long or a metre long. It's all, it all has a relationship to levels, you know. <clears throat> uh, so I think that's one of the big things. And once you comprehend that level, then you can start to really uh, pitch. I say, um, <clears throat> you know, I know in, in permaculture we talk a lot about patterns and it can be off of the various sort of hippie stuff and you go, oh, my God. But really, in the end, what it took me years to work this out, um, in the end, all I do is uh, I recognise the pattern across the landscape and I just apply another specific set of patterns um, across the landscape. That's how I see it. Um, and then, <clears throat> then patterns are often, often, as I said, that one swipe through the mid slope, if I can. Yeah. Um, so getting started, you know, we don't have to be on machines to do this work. You know, there's a lot of stuff we can do by hand. Um, and, you know, that's a lot less expensive to start out with. Yes, if you can um, uh, find a mentor um, to work with, that's great. But if you really want to do it, you'll find a way to engage in life, you know, in building life. And it, that can start small scale, you know. It's powerful. Oh, say... Uh, we only got to take one step in the right direction and nature takes 10 because I've seen it so many times and often that one step is just plant the water. Great deposition. 100% start accumulating the source of life and life just erupts out of that area. Yeah, I absolutely agree mm -hmm. and wholeheartedly agree as far as starting by hand. There's so many details in the material. I think if you're trying to start and you're starting with an excavator, you're actually... Mm -hmm doing yourself a disservice because you're going to learn much quicker by hand, by how that material feels, mm -hmm. by the moisture, by, you know, it's easier to tell what a material is like if you're compacting it by hand versus compacting it with the machine. Mm -hmm. I know when I was getting started, I was constantly jumping in and out of the machine to see like, okay, this is 30% clay. Okay. This is 60% mm -hmm. clay. Now I know how to just look at it and see, and I'm sure you too, okay, that's really clay soil or by how the machine pulls through it, by how it breaks apart, by the sheens it leaves, but you got to learn that stuff by hand or you just got no chance learning it on a machine. I'd say more often than not, the big kind of mistakes and errors I see are from people working with the machine and not actually understanding the differences in material. Yeah. So I've seen dams where people pack the center with sand because they don't understand the difference between sand and clay and they're not getting out there and touching the material with their hands. <clears throat> so that working by hand is just- Yeah, indeed, mate. Indeed, and you know, like, yeah, go ahead. I think we got a short delay. Uh, look, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think working by hand and 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 having having a relationship with the earth. Um, I, you know, un, unfortunately, I say like ninety five percent of earth movers are butchers, and it's not um, disrespecting them. But you know, you get on a twenty ton machine and you can you can belt the shit out of the landscape pretty quickly um, because you're not actually engaged with it. You're not respecting it. You're not revering that topsoil and knowing that's, you know, that is life and, and securing it. I can see Zach. <laughs> so I think actually getting intact with the earth, you know, and, and like just you know, having some admiration and, and revering life, you know, and processes and that, that comes from actually connecting with the earth. And it's not, 
sort of esoteric or spiritual stuff. And that's fine if people think that way. I mean, I'm part on that journey myself, but um, the practicalities of, of working with the earth, um, yeah, really comes, a lot of it comes by hand. I've, I've already wore out one shovel in my life. I'm halfway through the second one and I'm hoping to go through a third. Um, so that's sort of my approach, uh, you know, um, and again, it, as you said about operators, it, it comes to engineers as well, because I've seen uh, dams in New Caledonia where the engineers have told the, the operators to put in a keyway to physically lock it in the landscape, but not the keyway with clay to actually stop the water, you know, traveling through the walls. So they had the, they had the keyway, but not the, the other function of the keyway. So again, it's this separation from creating and doing to designing. And that reverence is so key. I mean, if we don't hold that reverence when we're working, we're going to make some really bad mistakes. I mean, we are physically, you know, taking out the scalpels and slicing up the earth. And I'd say it's way easier to do harm than actually to do good in that process. Um, and it's only from yep. Yep. really being connected to that landscape, valuing the topsoil, valuing the life in that landscape. I totally agree. And you know, one thing I don't know if you've experienced, but working here in the US, I experience it a lot that I'll actually have wildlife come up to me while working on the machine. We've had deer walk right up into the site as we're like crashing trees over with excavators and mountain lions come and leave their tracks over the excavator tracks. I've had hummingbirds like fly right up into the cab of the machine and kind of scope me for a second and fly away and maybe that happens to other <laughs> operators too but I, I have a hard time believing that it does <laughs> I, something that i know that you talk about a lot and i think it's at the core of this too is i often think of our work more as art less as science I think when we get in that engineering realm of science, we've lost some creativity, we've lost some reverence, we've lost some relation. And that's why I really talk about it as an awareness art. We need to be aware of the landscape and then we're co-creating art with that landscape. And I know I've seen you create some really beautiful artistic things. So I wonder if you can just speak to that. Like you, I imagine you have a lot of fun doing that towards the end of projects sometimes like myself. Yeah, I do, mate. I do. You know, I, I really, you know, for me, I, I like to call my work functional art um, because I, I think it, you know, it has beauty and, you know, you can really, with a, with an excavator, you know, you can actually be very, very sensitive, you know. Um, and as you said, you, as you're pulling through different materials, you can actually feel, you know, the resistance, you know, you can feel soft spots you can yeah it's it's quite incredible really but being being sensitive and and yeah being able to express um your creativity is it's a bit of a dream you know it's um i, I call it call an excavator my paintbrush you know um because that's what you can do you're sort of forming and sculpting and it's a real pleasure to be able to create something beautiful but also Beautiful in mind because you know the 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 enhancement to life that it's going to create. You know? So in the future, you can sort of picture it um, of how how resilient it is going to become um, through intelligent design. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's beautiful in the moment, and then it leaves this beautiful legacy mm. of these ripple effects mm. through that landscape of more vegetative growth, more wildlife, more insects, more fertility on that landscape. And it's, mm. yeah, one of my favorite things to do is come back and swim in the ponds I've made or drink the water <laughs> that I've helped tap from springs. It's, Beautiful. what more in life do you want? I often think about mm. how, uh, you know, if you asked me what I wanted to do as a little kid, I would have just said, I want to play in the mud and build forts all day. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much what I'm doing now is earth sculpting <laughs> and playing in the mud and building these fortresses for life. Nice. Um, 
I wonder if we can get into, you know, it's, it's sometimes easy too with these big machines to get in over your head. And one of the situations I'm always warned about, but haven't come across myself are these dispersive clay soils. So for people that don't know, these are clay soils that when they get wet, they liquefy. Um, I really haven't encountered them ever. I know they're, they're more common in Australia. I wonder what should people be aware for that? How do you know if you have dispersive clays or not? And what's okay to do and what's a problem in those kind of soils? Um, okay, well, the, the easiest way to, to work out if you've got dispersive clay is do a soil chest in a, in a jar. Um, and if you put your, your clay in there and you shake it up, it won't settle. It'll, it'll stay cloudy. So the water, the, the particles are dispersed. So that's one of the easy ways. Often looking at um, landscape will actually give you a, a particularly like cleared landscape, as most of Australia has been uh, deforested. So clear, it'll have this slumpy sort of form to it. And often you can tell it just doesn't look quite right. It doesn't, to the eye, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's real. There's something that's been manipulated. Uh, I taught down in Tasmania quite a few years ago and I come up with this term, the funky folds of Tiger Hill, because it all had this almost like stepped landscape, you know, and it was like, uh, and it took me a few days to work it out, you know. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we were teaching a course, so there's heaps of students, and it just took me a heap of, took me a bit of time to actually realise there was something odd about the pattern I was seeing. And in so in that, um, so once I took the forest off, obviously, you know, you've got some erosion and a lot of it slumped. Um, now, on that site, uh, Paul Keenan, he actually put swales in and they did work. They didn't cause erosion, uh, as in tunnel erosion from, from the dispersive clays. Um, but I have seen them in, uh, in Queensland uh, where they actually caused tunnel erosion through the floor of the swale. So they put a swale in, water sits, and it actually created a tunnel erosion through the floor and then sprung up about, sprung out about, I don't know, 10 metres down, down the ridge. Um, I, I've got a bit of a suspicion now, you know, I'm, I'm no academic, but I, I think I the soil structure back together. I, I don't know, that's just my, my um, feeling. Uh, but I think, I think we can, I think the biggest thing is getting that skin back on. If you are going to do it, obviously start at that minimum amount of work, you know, go for that one theme, one swipe through the landscape uh, and um, make sure it's vegetated, uh, your spillways working. And then as for dams, well, really, uh, I, I haven't built a dam in the, that dispersive clay country. Um, I've probably excavated through some of that material, being often been the sub subsoil material. And they go to the back of the dam wall anyway. Um, but I haven't seen uh, uh, too many things, well, too many, too much to do with dispersive play when I've been working with dams, mainly swales or terracing. Um, but I, I'm still undecided because, as I said, I've seen the two sites I've seen in, in uh, Tasmania and in Queensland. One has worked, one hasn't. Um, you know, it's quite the unknown. Uh, all I would say is if you are in dispersed, dispersive clays, caution uh, best. Do you really need earthworks? Like, can you just rip it? You know, can you open it up? Can you graze on it? You know, bale graze it if it's a damaged area. Um, just to get that skin back on, on the life and then move forward with that, yeah. Oh, I don't know if that's answered your questions, but that's just from my experience of what I've ex you know, been exposed to. Yeah, definitely. No, that was, a, that was a great answer. That was tons of good info there. And I see the same, you know, really, if we think of the earth as the earth's surface as the skin, when you slice open your own skin, 
blood flows to it, it clots up and then the skin reforms. And it's really important that we're doing that step with the earthworks as well. When we're making these slices that we're getting them vegetated, we're getting that skin cover back on. Um, that's one of the things I often see go wrong with earthworks projects where they didn't put enough mm -hmm. effort into that. Um, I wonder what are some of the, what have some of your most fun projects been or some of the biggest transformations you've been a part of? Um, my most fun project would be um, a place called Ecole Viviant uh, in the High Atlas of Morocco. Um, it was a, a school set up by a German lady who married a Berber guy and she didn't want to send her kids to the state school, so she built a school. Um, and uh, if, because, it, you know, it's, it's a very poor area, um, and if people can't, parents can't afford to send their kids to school, uh, they can come at the school and work um, for the tuition fees. And uh, a Swiss guy, <coughs> um, Lucas Mueller, uh volunteered there to do some permaculture gardens and, and some education for the kids and then ironically it's a, it's a 250 mil rainfall uh annual rainfall in the, in that area some of it's in winter and some of it's summer oh david we've I think we maybe really lost. it was like in a, the start of a valley and water was running straight down the road to the school. Um, so I, they got me in and we done some uh, a big well we done a, a quite a blended approach really we done some sort of big check dams up high at the start of the valley um, a heap of little fish scale patterning up even higher um, and then we come down to a big swale. Um, because I will go for a swale over a terrace when you've got a lot of water coming at you because it's got a, a big, chunky freeboard, okay? So it can take a shock. It can take a big surge of water over a, a terrace, in my opinion. Um, and then we dropped it into a couple of terraces uh, and then the water was pacified, everything was okay. But what was the most powerful part was the kids from the school come out and actually learned how to do the little smiley faces um across the landscape and then they realized how well they worked and they took that to their farms and they started doing that on their farms and that's human scale you know and that to me was gold you know um yeah that that was gold uh, very look the next one would be a project i worked on in shepparton in victoria here where uh a lady again her house got flooded <laughs> um because of the the property was adjusted and overgrazed they had a 20 mil storm in summer everything washed down um so monica got me to come and um and and through that process her daughter which was only 18 at the time uh was quite depressed you know which is understandable in some ways but then just after working with me a little bit, seeing what I'm doing and seeing the care that I'm taking, um, you know, the touching the soil, smelling it, even though I was like on a 25 ton machine. Um, but she, she really got interested in this process and, you know, she, she comes, she's come to life. She's totally engaged in, in regenerative ag. She's totally engaged in building lifeboats, you know, in, in nurturing life now. And she has a purpose. And now her and her mum um, and her mum's brother are on this beautiful journey of regenerative ag. You know, it's a, it's a large site. It's 350 acres. Um, it's a bit of hard country. Like, it's, it's southwest Victoria, so uh you get it's winter rainfall but they're only on about 500 mil rain a year so um and it's it's quite good because it's on the only hill in the area and everyone can see it and they all think she's a bit of a nutter at the moment but she's working her way forward to to change that thinking <laughs> yeah that was that's pretty powerful for me oh that's special that's yeah that's super powerful it reminds me of uh a story Sep said about working in these schools in Russia that were kind of for problem children. And so 
when they started this project, you know, the kids would just kill anything living, any bug or whatever, they would mm -hmm. smash it. Through these gardens, the kids started to learn the function of these different organisms. And they went from basically destroying any life to stewarding every life and finding the little earthworm and taking it to their garden plot and putting it next to their plant so their plant would do better. I think, you know, you really hit on something with that young generation. This can really give them hope, purpose, and fulfillment in a world that's so starved otherwise of those things. Yeah, mate, that, that's very, very true. You know, we, to, to, to engage in life and, and have a sense of wonder and admiration and, yeah, just that often that simple step of just getting that engagement, it's almost like a magnetic uh, lock once we get back to reality you know and we, and we see the beauty in life and and the simple i mean that's why gardening for me is really important for kids you know plant the seed and watch it grow is that's that's powerful you know um, building soils you know, and then watching life come in um yeah it, it's a beautiful journey mate and something that i you know as we get older i think we need to work more towards um, engaging the young generation and empowering, you know. And I think I think that that also gives them um, uh, well, it gives them an opportunity to express and be creative, you know. Yeah, and sort of that absolutely. daydreaming. Yeah. Yeah, creating on the landscape, experimenting. And this mm. is how we learn. You know, we create, we experiment, we interact, we observe the results. It's almost no wonder when you think of how disconnected people are with the natural world that we don't make good decisions when we get into positions of power. Because we just don't, you know, if you think, I think of the water rights system in the United States oftentimes, and mm. the people who are deciding these things oftentimes have no real connections to the landscapes that they're deciding about. And so they don't experience that the fish are dead in the river. They don't experience the water shortages that the tops of the trees are dying because they're in some high rise somewhere working on spreadsheets. Um, and I think so much of the change that we need to see happen comes from people just having a more direct relationship with their landscape, with their water, with their environment as a whole. Mm -hmm. Very true, mate. And again, that's for me comes back to design. And, and when I when I do a consultancy, you know, I I do that basic mainframe design because it allows space for evolution. You know, you do all this complex design, and then as you said before, you you're locked into it. You sort of dictated to it, as opposed to doing a simple elegant design that with that mainframe concept and then things can evolve and be expressed often on them access points because that's where your energy is going you know um yeah so over time you know clients needs clients experiences change interests change you know they grow because they're interacting with this with life more um so yeah. I absolutely agree. I tell clients if what we implement looks exactly like the design, we've screwed up because we should be changing <laughs> based on what we're seeing, where are we encountering clayier soils, sandier soils. Yeah. If we're not changing the design as we're doing it, we're not doing our job right. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, Mike. Indeed. Mm. I wonder what have been design to reality. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, it goes back to that first piece you mentioned, surveying, you know, that that mm -hmm. laser level is going to tell you what's level and what's not. And if you're not listening to it, you're maybe out of touch with reality a bit. I wonder what have been some of your most challenging projects? What were the times you were pulling your hair out or not sure if it was going to work or... Um, yeah, what have those some of those been like? Um, well, I, I, I done recently done a dam um, at a place called Gunning, uh, or maybe uh, six months ago now. But it was like it was quite dry when I started. Well, the soil, the top was dry, and then I hit 
but the subsoil soup almost as soon as I touched it, it went to oh like a stew. And I was like, and I was digging down, I was thinking, how the hell am I gonna, you know, because the machine's sinking down and I'm like, I'm making a big mess, you know. Uh, of course, I'm, you know, I pulled the topsoil off, but we, as soon as I took the skin off, I was in the soup. And then, you know, I went down about another meter and a half, and I'm thinking, oh my God, like, what am I going to do here? You know, finally, I hit the clay, and that was, you know, it had, uh, because it was good quality clay, you know, the water was running over the top of it. So, as soon as I took that sort of wetter material off the top, I could work it. But right through, the, through till I hit that clay, I was thinking, what the bloody hell am I going to do here? You know, like it was a bit of a challenge. Um, and yeah, probably another project in Morocco. Um, I, yeah, like it, with a, a friend of mine called Laurent Levy. Um, he's got a project outside of Casablanca. Um, they had about 10% ground cover uh, and a lot of shale rock. Um, so just trying to uh, think about, yeah, definitely think about water, but also access, um, you know, and I, that was when I was a bit more swale centric and I put in a big swale. Now that's a mistake. I should have put in a gradient road or a terrace um, and, you know, shortened up a, a dam. We made a larger dam to get across the valley, um, but I should have made that smaller. So there's always learning curves, um, but me, the soup dam was the hardest one. Um, yeah, uh, oh, look, I'm sure there's more, mate. Um, but there, there, there are the couple that come to mind. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, not all, off, I can't think of any more at the moment, but I'm there's definitely more. Oh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the more you do, the more you're going to run across mm. those kinds of situations. I know I encountered, you know, that, uh, soup layer once and mm. this was very mm. early on um you know working under somebody who thought they knew what they were doing uh, turns out we got the machine stuck for five days we had to dig it out twice by Ooh. hand i mean it was <laughs> i it was so bad eventually i had to climb in through the window because the door wouldn't open <laughs> anymore i mean it was just uh a mess and so it's you know and i you know it's my own dumb fault because i saw that layer i thought ooh, i don't want to touch that layer with the excavator uh, i did what they were having me do i did everything i could to stay on top of that layer they mm -hmm. were just adamant that i needed to go deeper i needed to drive the machine onto that layer and as soon as i did those tracks just started churning the mud <laughs> up and then stupidly they had me knock the clay into the hole so i'm just burying this machine as we're trying to get it out oh, saying, i don't think this is working mate i'm seeing less and less of the tracks each time i do this but uh it was a good lesson not gonna do that again <laughs> yeah it's, it can think, get bogged yeah yeah got it out eventually i mean that's the uh mm. <laughs> name of the game mm. right make it all work in the end yeah, there, well, that's true, mate. And and I think that comes to a, a to a really good point, Zach, in in being adaptable. You know, don't let your ego in design dictate to how it's going to come out at the end. You you have to work with the material that's there. And you know, so what comes, you know, when we're when I'm doing a dam, what comes out of the hole builds a wall. I may put a, a bench or a terrace into the side of the dam to pull out more material um but it is what it is when you finish it you know you're working with what you have so you have to be able to drop your ego and and, and be adapt adaptable uh, that's such a great point i would say the vast majority of the mistakes i've made from career throughout my career have been from that you know just getting too attached to it being a certain way and not being mm. adaptable enough to the landscape because really we should be constantly like water folding flexing and adapting to mm. that landscape mm. so that those actions actually deliver the result we're looking for yeah yeah very very true mate yeah absolutely um that sort of evolutionary approach to work to see what the material is um 
you know, how, how does it work? And again, that comes back to, you know, getting on that shovel as well. And, you know, how is it, how's that material to move, you know? Um, how does it hold up in its form in your batters, you know? Um, all that is going to dictate to how you can finish the job. Yeah. And I think this is where the, at the end. Yeah. And I think this is where the scale comes in so well too, because if you want to build a terrace, you don't need to build the kilometer long terrace at the beginning. If you don't know what you're doing, build a little 10 foot section of it, see how that responds, mm. see if it works mm. like you wanted mm. it to then do the whole mm. section or even better do a yeah. little model with the shovel and simulate some rainfall, mm. see how that's working. We can, make all of our experiments small enough that the failures aren't catastrophic so that as we scale up, we start to feel more and more confident in what we're doing. We've kind of verified it already in a way. Yeah, for sure, mate. I, I say baby steps and baby mistakes. That's perfect. Yep. Because, yeah, you can run out there and, you know, and then coming back to um, you said about, getting the skin back on on the landscape you know i've done i've done jobs where clients have wanted me to do well i end up doing like 20 days on a 20 ton machine so you know that's a that's a lot of cubic meters of earth moved um in then 20 days and i said well i think you know in my opinion how about i come and do 10 days you know do a certain section of the work you come in get the vegetation back on get the skin on you know no, 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 we want you to do um, the 20 days and uh, we'll, we will um, get the vegetation on. Okay, but, you know, it didn't happen. So, you know, like I've, I've just found that, yes, transport for a machine can be expensive, but so is, um, you know, not getting the site vegetated and secured properly. You get a big rain event, you know, you're going to get some erosion um, on the back cuts and things like that of, of the work. So, yeah, doing enough and, and then getting the skin on is critical, in my opinion. I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. It's so easy to make a huge disturbance with these machines. And if you're not yeah. vegetating afterwards, it's not going to work out as intended, or it's at least going to take some time to get there and probably have some missteps or sidesteps along the way. Mm. Um, I find I'm constantly trying to reduce the amount of fire hose I'm aiming at the client in terms of how much work they have to do afterwards, you know, make it these little mm. bite-sized chunks so that mm. they want to keep doing it. I'd say early on in my career, I was always pushing for more, 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 bigger, wider, whatever. And oftentimes unintentionally we would push the client past their comfort point so they'd get to the point where it's like this is a lot of work i don't want to do more of this this is already an overwhelming amount of work whereas if you keep it small they get comfortable with it it gets easier and easier as you learn to be able to do bigger and bigger chunks of it um, so i i think that's really important to be ready to pull the reins back on the client to make sure it stays fun for them because ultimately they're oftentimes doing this as a value quality of life lifestyle piece. And so if you're making it unenjoyable, it's not really serving their goals. Yeah, yeah really good point, mate. Really good point. And something I totally agree with um, because of the fact where I was doing the, the damn it, gunning, the client wanted me to do more. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I think about the transport of the machine in Australia being distances. Um, but I said, look, you know, transport's really cheap to, to get the machine on site. I said, we can always come back and do more, you know, just get this stuff that we've done, get it vegetated, get it secured. And, and then, you know, we've, we've got plans to come back and, and do, a, do another dam and, and some more terracing um, to connect uh, what we've already done to the new dam. But it's just stages. I think that's really critical. You know, really good point, mate. Don't don't overwhelm the client because they're often working another job. Um, and again, it comes back to letting the site demonstrate its evolution because on that first initial section of work, 
you can work out what species, what cover crops work really well, what trees do really well, like Mark Shepard's stun approach, you know, simply tuttle utter neglect. You know, you can do all that in a small scale and then you can be much more confident and prepared to jump out into that bigger one if you want. Because you already, you already know what you're up for. Absolutely. I'm constantly telling people the same thing because you know what trees are going to work. You know what you need to do to have them be successful. And then, you know, if yeah. you start with 10 and figure out what you need to do, you can say, okay, I can manage a thousand at a time or 10,000 at a time or whatever it is, but you're not going into it blind. You're going into it with expectations of how much work it's going to require at what times of year, yeah. what kinds of things you need to do to help support the systems you're putting into place to actually thrive instead of just survive or sometimes not even survive. Indeed, mate. Yeah, baby steps is critical. And, and I think, you know, starting, you know, why, why I love your work, Zach, you know, you, you create almost a human scale environment, like giving people access to a water body I think is psychologically and spiritually really, really powerful. You know, we all love to live near or hang out near the water. And I think, you know, this, this sort of water retention landscape, but with that, ideally with that water body close to your house, um, I think that's really powerful. And there's so many lessons. Yeah. <laughs> so many lessons that you can learn from that one water body near the house you know, and enjoyment for the client. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The beauty, the life that's coming mm. and going every day. Mm. When the water body's right next to your house, you notice the deer coming to drink, the songbirds coming, the bees at the end of day and the beginning of day. You really see the life unfolding all around you in this very mm. intimate way, like it's your outdoor living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I think that's a... It's something that, you know, as soon as I, I come across your work, I was like, wow, I like this guy. And then, you know, we had a bit of a chat and I seen your hands and I was like, oh, this guy's pretty cool. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, I love your work, Zach, you know, and I think that connecting what we do to the human element is really powerful. We can sort of jump out there on this broad or grand theme and put that across the landscape. And that's great. But let's bring it back to the human environment and build lifeboats, you know, build this uh, resilience and security in landscape and beauty and uh, enjoyment, interaction. I mean, there's, yeah, on and on you could go with that one water body. Absolutely. I love one of my favorite things is building these human interaction points, the rocks mm. to sun yourself on after swimming or mm. the pier mm. to go fishing on. Because the easier you make it to interact with that water body, the more connected someone's going to be with it, the more mm. they're going to benefit mm. from it and benefit their landscape, you know, seeing everything unfold that happens when you do hold water on a landscape. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, no, nice one, mate. I wonder, you know, I I was really fortunate to come across SEP and I was working as a contractor and then got to go to a workshop with SEP Holzer and it just changed my world and I started steering myself in that direction. I wonder, can you share a bit about your journey, how you went from where you were to, you know, master earth worker working around the world? Um. Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, look, I, I was a very angry young man, you could say, and I, I was luckily I, I did come across uh, Bill Mollison, Global Gardener, and I was just like, wow, you know, I like this fella. He talks about housing and trees and water and uh, um, life in general, and he's got the hands that demonstrate for me that he worked and not just talked. Um, so I sort of, I got involved in that. I ended up doing P2C with Bill and then on, then volunteered with Jeff Lawton up at Tagari Farm 20 odd years ago. Um, and I got to see Tagari Farm, which is about 140 acres. I got to see that have 300 mils of rain 
in one day. So I, I got to see all the earthworks work, you know, back flood swales, fill up a dam, fill up, back flood, and then spill over. And the intricacies of, of water, you know, how, how intelligent and uh, precise that we can be. Um, and then, you know, Jeff Flawton is renowned for earthworks. So uh, I got to hang out with him a bit. And then um, I, 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 my father was an earth mover. Um, he was a very good dozer operator. Uh, so I'd sort of been exposed to that. And I had worked in um, civil earthworks building dual lane highway construction. So I've worked with, you know, excavators and dozers, dump trucks and scrapers and, you know, rollers and all that. So I knew the machines um, and I knew how much they could move. And I've worked a hell of a lot with a shovel, okay? First, I've already done a lot with a shovel. Um, and, you know, I'd already, already uh, operated a fair bit of machinery because I worked in forestry and agriculture and all that. So jumping on a machine wasn't a hurdle to me. I knew, already knew the sort of safety limitations, you can say, because you can roll them over. Um, so you've got to be a bit aware of it, that. And then, um, so I had this in my background and um, I, I got to, in 2007, really, um, uh, is where I started to learn to operate excavators. That was when I was working for Bill Mollison in Tasmania. Um, so I, I got to master, I got to jump from off the manual shovel to the, to the machine shovel and I picked it up pretty quickly. And, and then really from there, I, I was doing a few consultancies and getting other operators in, which no offense to them, but they're butchers and you have to challenge your idea and what you want. Um, and then I, so I started dry hiring machines and, and doing all the work myself. So I had to be brave at the start, um, but it was either put up with a substandard job or, or start to develop my own operating skills to, to articulate or to execute my vision. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. So that's yeah, that's got me going. one of those rubs I've come up with bunch against especially in you know before I was really doing most of the work myself in the machine because it's you know it's so hard a to articulate your vision that's in your own brain b to have yeah. that other person understand it care about it and then c to have them even able to implement it you know I've seen everything from earth movers where it's really fun to work with them and I learn a lot to other ones where we have to say we have to close this project and send them away because we're doing more harm than good right now. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing for people as they're getting started in this. It's hard to know if it's coming out well or not when you're just getting started, but you really have to be ready to pull the trigger if the person's not listening to you, if you're not liking the results, stop it early don't keep going because you're just going to make a mess and cost the person lots of money and it's better to say you know we got to wrap up here and just live to fight another day because we're not going to get our desired outcome yeah no very true mate because you, you just think of an operator mixing the subsoils and topsoils you know not respecting topsoil and skinning it off stocking it you know, they often come in and just start and it's like, oh, well, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been through quite a few hurdles, you know, um, uh, and even like working, like, like lucky we can operate because I've worked in um, New Caledonia quite a bit and Morocco, so French speaking. Um, I, I speak a little bit of French, uh, working French. Um, but, you know, just that brutality, you know, is is really particularly when you care. Uh, and what I find actually is, I find um, uh, earthworks because it is so impactful. Uh, I I often find I go on a journey with people. Um, so you do a consultancy, you bring in the machines, like design, bring in the machines. It's actually quite emotional for people when they're attached to the land because you're 
you're pulling everything apart, you're, you know, brutalizing things, and then slowly you're bringing it back together. But at the, some time, some clients are like, well, particularly females, because maybe they're more in tune with their emotions, but a lot of my clients are, you know, mid-age females. Um, and yeah, they're very, it's very emotional. And it took me a while to understand this. So that's coming back to that sort of butchering operator. It's really hard. You almost, you have to, okay, that's it, stop. Yeah, you have to stop, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because there's just no getting it back. You, you mix that topsoil no. in, you mix the clay with the sand. You can't unmix it. You're just kind of screwed yeah. at that point. And I think that's yeah. a really good point, you know, People like you and I, we know the destruction is a means to an end. We know what it's going to look mm. like when the water body's full. But when we're leaving it, we it looks like a bomb went off. You know, all the vegetation yeah. is just nuked and it's just bare earth everywhere. You know, we do our mulching and seeding and all of that, obviously. Mm. But we know what it's going to look like. The client doesn't know what it's going to look like yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it's emotional, you know. It's um, and yeah, you've got to. That's why I say the laser levels, God. If you're going to work with a with another earth mover, you need to know if you can have a rapport with them first. You know, are they going to listen to you? Um, yeah, like there's 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 a lot can go wrong, and that's you know, if you if you're keen on on getting into this world, hire a little one and a half ton machine. They're very cheap. You can start on an urban scale and you can start to get a feel of what you can achieve with a machine. Um, you know, sometimes small scale stuff, it's actually quicker to do by hand. Um, but I really enjoyed, I had a I had a, the three and a half ton machine at my place here. But for about a month, I, I knew the guy who owned it. So he dropped it off and just when I turned it on, he got charged me for it. But what I loved was, um, uh, doing that mix of doing the earthworks and actually getting off the machine and jumping on the shovel and just doing that little bit of finesse. Uh, I found that really enjoyable. Whereas a lot of the time I'm on a machine, I don't get off because, you know, it's, um, I've got work to do and, you know, there may be someone else there sort of cleaning up or I'm on doing on a broad scale. So that finesse isn't warranted. Um, you know, uh, in Australia, we use tilt mud buckets, uh, which, which are a brilliant thing because it's your wrist. You know, I can I can sit somewhere and I can batter off that and create a, a nice batter and, and I can change the geometry. You know, I can really, that's why I say these sculpting with the tilt mud buckets are a beautiful addition to an excavator. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they give you much more flexibility with your paintbrush. Yeah. Particularly the finish. You know, you can skin topsoil off so much easier. You can reapply it um, because you can change the geometry of your bucket. So. And you can get those layers just perfect instead of, you know, slicing a little exactly. subsoil and mixing a little topsoil. Yes. You can just yeah, yeah, get yeah, it exactly. perfect on that. Yeah, layer. you can get it. That's right. You can just skin it off like a sharp knife. Yeah. Yeah. I have loved every time I've yeah. gotten to work with them. I love it. I almost yeah. am glad I didn't learn on them because then I think I would be very frustrated with everything yeah, else. Absolutely, mate. <laughs> because it is, it is a big, big hurdle for me to go without them now. You know, it's a totally different approach to where you put the machine and all that to actually be able to work and finish. You know, I find yeah. it somewhat very frustrating without them. I mean, I can still do it, but it's not to the quality that I know I can get. And that's sort of hard, you know, to accept. That's but, the you know, hardest. That's all you got. Yeah. yeah. That's the hardest part when you care so much like you and I do. Yeah. We want to do the very best every time we're on a machine. Yeah. And yes. so, you know, every little square centimeter of soil that gets yeah. mixed into the wrong layer is like, you know, you're just stabbing me in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah true but yeah well i could keep chatting with you all day but i don't want to uh eat up all the time with my own questions i think we're at a good point here to open it up to the audience so what we're going to do is we're going to have people if you want to ask your question uh with your voice raise your hand and then i can allow you to talk 
and you'll unmute yourself to ask your question. And then I see we have a bunch in the question and answer we'll start to get through. Um, and if you have asked your question in the chat, please ask them in the question and answer just so that they're a little bit easier to keep track of. Um, so Scott Danner, um, I'm gonna allow you to talk, ask you to take off mute and you can ask your question. I'm sorry, if I hit um Yep, we're good, we can hear you now. I, I don't have a question, I apologize. Oh, okay, no worries. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Alan Peterson, how about you? Yeah, uh, just a basic, simple question. Uh, David, have you done any work in Southern California and can you tell me about any of your projects? Uh, no, I've, I've only worked in Georgia, in America. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, Morocco, I've done a fair bit of work in Morocco um, on quite a few projects. So if you're sort of thinking of dry landish. Um, uh, and a uh, bit in Jordan. So, um, so if, you, if, you had, uh, if you had one thing for me to think about with my dry land, what should I think about? Um, what, what's, what's the context though? Is it what sort of scale, uh, size is it? Uh, how many four, acres? Four, 40 acres in uh, uh, Campo, California, near the Mexican border. Uh, probably 10 to 12 inches of rain, uh, elevation okay. from 31 down to 26. Formerly, there was a, a seasonal creek, but in the last 20 years, that's kind of dried up. There's water, but it's uh, several hundred feet uh, below ground in terms of uh, the aquifer. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just want to create a, I've, I've created a little bit of a riparian habitat for the animals by pumping water, but I would like to be able to capture water and uh, try to make a little bit of a change in the environment. Um, one thing I always look for, is there any roads above you? Um, well, like actually, main uh, roads? there are roads uh, through the property. Uh, to say above, I guess, I guess that'd be technically correct. Um, I mean, the top of the uh, elevation is, um, uh, it's decomposed granite. There are, it's clearly that water has collected on the top of the decomposed granite and uh, sculpted. it. Um, there's some um, water that could perhaps be harvested from the air. Um, but in, in general, in a general sense, it really isn't much above me. So you, you don't get any like, runoff coming through the site? Well, the you know, um, I'm still learning about the property, honestly. Um, yeah. It's clear that water does run off, and I think most of it sinks quite quickly through the decomposed granite. Um, mm -hmm. You can sort of feel that, uh, depending on how close you are to the, uh, the rock faces yourself, the amount of uh, space between the, the topsoil and the, uh, the, the clay underneath varies. So if you go just even even uh, 100 feet from the edge of the rocks, you see that the uh, the decomposed crank is much, much deeper. But in the first uh, 100 feet, it, it's really not that deep. Um, and I, I can see some obvious kind of li listening to you folks, which has been wonderful. Uh, listening to you folks, I can see some obvious kind of simple, small things to do, which I think <laughs> with a hand shovel is the way to go. And, and sort of a work on creating uh, spaces where water might be c collected. Um, I was thinking uh, in, in my ignorance or, or perhaps uh, I was thinking perhaps cisterns in certain parts of the property might allow me to collect some of that rainwater comes right off the rock and then use it for other reasons. But I don't know if you know if that's a good idea. Oh, well, collecting any water is a great idea. Certainly try to start at the top um, because the more that you impound water at the top, uh, the water is going to percolate through the landscape and potentially spring out lower. Um, so starting at the top is a good thing because one, you, I said to a client the other day, um, I said, we can either start at the top and, and deal with the ping pong ball or we can start down here and try to deal with the cannonball. <laughs> um, For sure. So if you can get that in your mind as a mental picture, it's really powerful because if we can start at the top and we pacify that water, um, and, and get it to do its work and, and meander through, um, then we get a better result down the bottom. I always look for roads though above because that gives you, in, in dry lands, 
if it's a sealed road, well, it's 100% runoff. So yeah. you're going to get a big flash event. So yeah. if you're gonna, if that does happen, then to do, uh, you know, like you guys, beaver dams or in the riparian zone, um, leaky weirs, you know, we call it here or whatever, to, to just try to impound that water and and get it into into the soil. Um, okay. I think is is a really important place to start. Start at the top, mate. Start yeah. at the top, start small and just work your way down. Obviously, your works are going to get bigger because it's going to be as you get down lower because you've got more water. Um, but you start at the top, simple, um, and, and, and just take baby steps. Watch when you do spillways, watch your um, that granite country can be very, very erosive. So, because yeah. you've got big quartz sort of crystals in there, um, it's like a really rough sandpaper. So if you don't get your spillways set up right, whether you want to do a bit of rock armoring on them, or you know we do level seal spillways, so it's sort of uh, like a window seal. You, I, I like to explain it so they're very passive. Um, uh -huh. But that that'd be one caution is just watch your spillways because you'll get a fair bit of erosion if if they're too concentrated to a point. Now that makes that makes perfect sense, and frankly, that's kind of what I got out of listening to you. That I need to start at the top and work with my my way yep. down. So, makes a lot of sense. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. Hoffman, Caleb, would you like to uh, ask your question next here? Yes, of course. Thank you guys so much for the presentation. This has been truly great. Um, <clears throat> I do. I've got. Um, one or two questions, maybe maybe a third uh, cheeky one. But the first one is, um, what do you, Doc, what do you typically put together for a show of design for the client when you're coming on to the property for them? You know, do you do you paper? Do you, you know, do you have somebody or do you personally put together nice illustrator, you know, like nice PDF type um, computer illustrations? Um, I, depending on, you know, like I'll, I'll do a consultancy. My first process is a consultancy because I need to know, um, if I can communicate with the client, if we're on the same page, you know, can we, do we have a rapport? Um, and then if the client wants to move forward, yes, I'll, um, I'll do my rough hand drawn design and then I'll get someone to make it pretty. Um, but I, Again, I really focus on that basic mainframe design. I don't go too complex or too fancy. Um, I always try to keep it simple. Um, you know, simple is beautiful. Uh, so don't, because the intelligence is in um, when you're dealing with earthworks, it's just working at that simple theme across a landscape. Doesn't have to, you don't have to design all the little details of ponds and spillways, but just that theme of where where can you, where is there water running into the top of the property? And what's, you know, where can you actually dissipate energy and impound that water and then make it move through the site? Um, so that's sort of my process. I don't get too caught up on the details of design. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really um, great point. I, you know, I tell my clients what I do is a kindergartner level sketch on a base map. And <laughs> I think like you're saying, Doc, it's the value is in the concepts of the design, not the map. I see a lot of permaculturists get too tied up into these beautiful PDF designs where they feel like they need to learn Illustrator or AutoCAD or, and, you know, I always offer people my kindergartner level sketch. And then we have someone who can do fancier ones if they want. One person ever has opted for the fancier ones. So most clients are totally happy with that kindergartner level sketch, as long as they are understanding that the values in the concepts of the design, not the piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, you know, for me, like that could be three days work or four days work on a machine. If, if the client can pay for a design, well, I might be able to do half that work for the price of that design. You know, so that's where I'm, I'm not like, I'm not doing this for money. We all need to make money and make a living, but it isn't my, you know, drive to do this work. You know, I want, I don't want to spend the client's money. I'd rather see them 
actually pay for the work or pay for trees as opposed to pay for a piece of paper. Now, if they need it to get the concept, okay. But if, you know, people come to me because I suppose my experience and they, they have, they trust what I do. You know, they, they've looked at my work, like people look at Zach's work. He's got a track record of experience. If you're new and starting out, yes, you may want to focus a bit more on, on the design to, to build up the confidence. But for me, I've just found that I don't, uh, go too far down that road of fancy designs because design to reality, it, you know, it's going to change. You know, it's, it's conceptual. This is conceptual. We can't design, you know, Bill Molson always said, uh, the map is not the territory. And, and we know that. It's like a contour map is not that landscape. It is a, a generalisation of that landscape, Okay. So draw all you want along them contour lines and take your heights, but that's not reality. There is, there's going to be variation. So you can't get caught on that. And you mentioned something there, Doc, that really rings true for me is let's get the resources going into the landscape, not that time mm. for somebody to spend a bunch of time on a computer making a pretty picture. Like oftentimes the price of some of these designs, we could do half, or I've even seen designs that are, you know, twenty to sixty thousand dollars, where we can do the whole project for that. A lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. so that's, huh? that's. Thank you. That was a great. That was a great answer. That really, that really is going to help me clarify just what to do moving forward. You know, just that basic sketch. You know, I iterate what it has to do and then be able to implement and be flexible mm. that's, that's such yep. a great thing thank you very much for that my um my second question is a question about a restoration process that that i've been reading about a little bit and and maybe a bit of of of, of possible conflict just for the drama and the fun but um my question is, is around um process-based restoration have you have you spent any time looking into that reading about that um and do you do you have any thoughts on on the piece of, uh, the, the process based uh, restoration? can you just i'm not familiar with the term yeah can so you just it, elaborate a bit more yeah yeah so process-based restoration is a type of watershed restoration that focuses on pacification devices that are inherently structured by vegetative material. So they'll they'll come in, they'll they'll cut pines or eucalypts or, or whatever, whatever hard, bushy, manzanita, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. material you have locally sourced, and they'll come in and they will actually drive it into waterways. Water, uh, okay. Device with stakes. Um, yeah, very much like a leaky weir, um, David. Yeah, yeah. very, yeah. very similar. No, I've got technique. it. I've got it. Yeah, yeah. Look, I've done a little bit of it. I wouldn't say heaps, but also what I've um, been involved in is, um, and I'll tell clients, uh, creating bias wells. Now, often, you know, a lot of our forest systems have been pretty well built around. You know, um, they knocked all the valuable timber out and butchered it all, and Often it's stagnant, you know, we're, in Australia, we've sort of got this stagnant eucalypt forest um, where trees are, and, and I can imagine it could be the same in, a, in, a, in, a, in America where you've got a pine forest, you know, you've got this event, germination event, and they're all just sitting there. There's very little diversity underneath, you know, there's no big mature trees really. So I think we can go through and cycle that material down, actually lay it on a contoured sort of pattern um, cut it up so it gets in contact with the ground and uh, create these bioswales. We can plant into it. We can chuck seeds into it. Um, but I think that what we do, again, we start at the top and um, work down. And so doing these sort of leaky weeds, absolutely, it's a brilliant idea. Uh, Adam, whatever material, I think anything that you can do by hand, a human scale is, is, is really, really powerful. We don't always need to bring in machines. A bit of hard jack is actually good for us yeah. not mindless work but a bit of sweat and, uh, effort is is a good thing and, and it's amazing what we can do with either rock or or trees you know 
if we can manhandle them and manipulate them, we can we can achieve a lot. So I think that's a great approach, myself. Um, I think it, we've got to blend again, blend all these approaches together. Let's let's not be egotistical uh, about. I'm a bit over the, the whole ego game um, in in you know this world. I suppose you know I, I just see if something works, let's use it. I don't care who made it, whatever. Let's use it. Let's apply it. Let's bring in these different approaches and and blend them all together. They're elegant and it makes it more resilient. And more enjoyable, you know. It's more diverse, etc. Yeah, in a, in a integrate integration is just so key in this mm. process, right? So my yeah. my bit, my bit of drama is is the people who I've heard pushing the process based restoration framework um, are also really adamant and quite vocal. And, and I haven't been able to sit down with them. I've reached out a few times to see if they could clarify their viewpoints on this, but they're really adamant that earthworks for watershed restoration is actually is actually not the solution they they say you can't fix the problem with what the problem and i'd love to hear your you know your view uh, okay um well look uh, you know it's very possible they're true but how much human energy can you put into that broad that if you're talking about a big big area like to me, it doesn't make. If you've got, if you're in a, a majority world country and labor's cheap, okay, of course you can. But can you do that in the first world? Like uh, for me, with a bit of intelligence in design and only the bare minimum of earthworks, you can have a profound effect um, to initiate the repair. Like you know, coming in and going swa swa swa. Yeah, absolutely. I totally I disagree with that. But coming in and, and putting in maybe two or three acupuncture points, as Zach might call them, or you know, just themes where you've got really bad erosion. How do you how do you actually pull that up? You know, you you may want to actually stop that water coming into that valley or to that head cut. You might you might have to re you know redirect that water flow. So, you know, to me, it's, a, again, it's a blended approach. I, like, yeah, of course their system works. Of course using, what happens if you don't have biomass and when you don't have rock, what do you do? You know, what do they do? You know, where if there's no rock and there's no trees? Tell me, I ask them that question, you know, I ask them that yeah, question. So, yeah. Do it in Idyllic Valley with tons of material, so. And I think what we're kind of circling around to is everything has a context. Everything has a location where it works mm. and a location where it doesn't work. And both location and management, like in our experience with process-based restoration, you know, a beaver is constantly tending their dams, constantly. Mm. And that interaction between earth, wood, and water loves to erode. Earth will find those cracks and seams. So... I've seen process-based restoration work really well where people can tend it, they can come back to it and repair it each year. But if you're not gonna have that, it's gonna be very short term um, and then it's gonna be through. And another piece that I think is really relevant to this discussion is, um, you know, you look at what's happened to our watersheds. The damage has been done with these big machines. We've used dredges and literally changed the course of rivers to undo that with a shovel and with hand energy is a huge undertaking. So how broken is the system and how broken the system is that depends on how heavy handed we have to be with the fix. If you're looking at a waterway that's been dredged, it's been levied, it's been totally disconnected from its floodplain, it's really hard to undo that with these softer, subtler techniques. Whereas if you have a watershed that's not as degraded, the softer, subtler techniques will do everything you need to to deliver the results you're looking for. Yeah, that's I, such valuable information for you guys. I really, I really appreciate that. Um, I find it so so critical to to kind of a, attempt to put into a uh, thesis an antithesis so we can try to figure out what the what the synthesis truly is and. And kind of get down to that it's that's such a valuable conversation 
um, not to backpedal too far, but kind of what you're talking about with bioswales, I think is such a critical management change. I've been, I'm down here in the snow, he's actually just across the range from Doc. And I've been speaking quite a bit with the National Park Service here. There's a few folks that, that, that uh, you know, understand, understand the importance of uh, working with living systems and the shift we have to make in our minds of, of instead of doing controlled burns, trying to get them to just drop material on contour and start, you know, cycling that, you know, cycling that system in the, in the right direction. Um, I would be so interested to kind of, you know, get you doc in, in on that conversation as well and kind of put, put them to task a bit more and see if we could get that shift. I, I would be, that would be such a huge, mm -hmm. huge change in my opinion. So I'd love to, I'd love to chat with you doc on that a bit, a bit further. Um, that, that, those were my questions and that was kind of, that was kind of most of the things that I wanted to wanted to put in. I really, really value you guys' time. Really value your guys' inputs and, and insights. This is this has been really pleasant. Cool. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Thank you, Hoffman. Um, Alex Paulette, would you like to ask your question next? Yeah, first of all, just like to say thanks guys for putting this on. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yep. I'm from South Carolina, United States. Uh, I'm working on my own uh, mid slope, slight fall access road. So it's really encouraging to hear y'all say that. In fact, a whole, probably about 10 of the points y'all have said have been very encouraging and inspiring because they've been similar pain points for me. And just to hear that, okay, the pros face these similar things too. That's great or have faced. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do a homestead. I don't have tons of disposable cash. I want to try and aim it correctly. I'm interested in earthworks, so I want to do that as a hobby too. But if I'm looking at this from a purely economic standpoint, what are some of the cost benefit or return on investment sort of factors that y'all consider with these projects, considering they're, they're so multifaceted? I can look at it from water volume and water yield and compare that to my well. And I just wonder if there's other sort of things that y'all would typically look at if a client were to ask you about those sorts of questions. Um, well, for me, storing water as high as possible in a water body to um, gravity feed the system is, is, a, is an excellent investment, I would say. Um, so there's that respect um, and well the quality of life that, that you generate for your environment for me that's another great investment um, but really in a practical level it's for me it's, it's storing water so people can gravity feed it whether that's in a fire or whether that's for livestock or irrigation for trees etc that's sort of the best uh, value for money um, impact that I think I have. Yeah, you know, I think, well, I know that water is the ultimate capital of any farmer. Any farmer, whether you're farming corn or cows or whatever, water is your bottom line. And if you don't have enough of it, your operation's not going to do what it could. Um, so I think you know, even if we're just looking at it from an economic standpoint, putting in these water infrastructure pieces that are going to yield year over year is hugely valuable. You compare it to something like a well that, yes, it's working now. Is it working in 10 years? Is it working in 20? Is it working in 100? At our current rate of depletion of groundwater, no is the answer to a lot of those questions. Um, so one, it's your security on the landscape. It's your productivity on the landscape. And then I look at projects like one of Rajendra's that we saw. A community ran out of water, couldn't do agriculture because they're out of water, drilled 27 boreholes, all dry. And then for the same cost, they built one water body. Their increase in agricultural productivity going from nine hectares to 650 paid for the cost of the dam four times over the first year. So the first year their investment was 4X and it's going to be that every year moving forward for their kids, for their grandchildren. Um, so it's really the investment that keeps on giving in a way when you bring water to a landscape. Wow, thank you. 
Yeah, great question. Um, how are you doing on time, Doc? We're getting to the end of, of our 90 minutes here. Should we wrap up? Uh, it's uh, up to you, mate. I'm, I'm happy to answer a couple more questions if you want, or, or okay. we can leave it at that, mate. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, no, if you don't mind, let's. Uh, I know we've got a bunch of questions in the question and answer here. Um, and we'll just go through a couple of these while we got you on the line here. One thing that I know I was wondering too, um, question here, are you facing resistance from local community regulations to do these kind of projects? Ah, yeah, well, always, you know. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I don't go down that uh, bureaucratic level. Like I say to clients, you want to you uh, approach the the bureaucracy you go ahead but for me it's all about terminology you know in australia we can only hold um 10 of the rain that hits our land um and that's great well so then we can do a whole load of uh erosion sediment control um you know works we can do wildlife habitat works you know what they're against which there is some rationale is is holding all the water well we're not, you know, we're working on raindrops. We're not, we're not, we're not even working on buckets of water. You know, it's all about catching the raindrops and then pounding that raindrop into the landscape. And, and as you, you know, to that small water cycle. So I don't get caught, you know, on um, uh, the bureaucratic, uh, I'll, I'll be polite, um, because it doesn't make sense. You know, I know, I know the more work we do up high, influences the work that what happens down lower so i know that we're doing i don't have any problems with the work i do ethically and so i don't ask for permission i totally agree we find exactly the same thing we're in this paradigm legally right now where we're prioritizing downstream flow what does that do it short circuits all of our fresh water into the ocean and if we're constantly prioritizing downstream flow, we're going to have more and more water scarcity, more and more dead rivers, more and more water crises, water wars. And so it, we really, I think we're in this position where we need to ask forgiveness instead of permission. We need to break the laws yeah. and then change the laws to get over yep. this inherently destructive paradigm. Indeed, mate. Indeed. Um, if you had just one piece of machinery, tractor, digger, et cetera, for your property, what would you choose? Oh. Well, it depends on where, where you are. I mean, look, for me, an excavator is a very useful piece of machinery at the start, particularly if you've got a bit of forestry because you can have a log grab on it or your thumb bucket that you talk about. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a pretty useful bit of gear. Um, look, you can do a lot of work with an old tractor. Um, if that's all you got, you can do a lot of work with a shovel. You know, it really depends on, you know, are you going to want to do any cropping with the tractor or, you know, what are you going to do? Slash after grazing, you know, are you going to have animals? Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of unknowns there. Um, personally, you know, I, I think a, a, an excavator is a great item um, for a farm, but yeah. Uh, at the same time, you can dry hire them. They're not that expensive to hire. Uh, I totally you know, why, agree. Why, yeah. why, risk, why risk the blowing a hose? There's 300 bucks. Uh, you track, you know, like there's a couple of grand, like a ram, you know, like, yeah. So my preference is dry hire it if you can. I totally agree. And I, I, people, I think get really attached to the thing, but in one month with the machine, you can make a year's worth mm. of work for revegetation easy. So if that thing's going 12 totally. months a year, you're doing something wrong on the property more likely than not. <laughs> Indeed, man. Uh, a good question here with your guys' context these last couple of months. In Australia, we've been experiencing severe rain events for about eight months now. When there are large amounts of water, how do we manage water on a landscape without causing destruction or should it be diverted off the property? Well, where, where do you divert it to? Well, into a, into a water course, you know, um, if you divert it with the wet word divert, you're gonna put a fall or make it run. So therefore you're gonna cause more problems. 
I think I think elegant earthworks actually manage the the landscape wet or dry. You know, you're always working to always having a freeboard. So from your know, spillway height to the mound height, whether it's a dam wall or a terrace or a swale, there's always or a grading road. There's always a, a freeboard. So as long as you've got freeboard intact and if you are going, you know you're in a climate that you're going to get a lot of rain, multiple spillways, then you can actually pacify the, them big rain events. Uh, and that's pretty proven too. So we can actually pacify it and take the, the severity out of them impactful events. Um, so it's not just for dry, not just for impounding water for when we don't have rain, but it's actually to manage uh, the big events more passively for me, from my experience, yeah. Yeah, totally. We're adding these shock absorbers to the system. I always think of mm. uh, a friend of mine, Ben Fox, place in Vermont. During Hurricane Katrina, it destroyed half of the state with the amount of rain they received. But on his place, water was barely trickling out during and after yeah. the storm because Beautiful. it just soaked that all up. So if everyone did that, our flooding pressures during those big events would be dramatically reduced. Yeah, totally, totally, mate. We've got to create that sponge, you know, and yeah. once the sponge is full, we give it a, an avenue to passively move and we don't have any issues really, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we made reference to a lifeboat um, in terms of regenerative ah, yes. ag. They haven't heard that before. Wondering what does it mean? Ah, ah that's my rough Australian lang lingo. I say I don't speak English, I speak Australian. And maybe to some Australians, <laughs> it's not Australian. <laughs> um, a lifeboat, like, like if we think of it in its true word, well, what I see and um, I was having a chat to Zach the other day about um, creating these lifeboats because, you know, often we go into a, to a site and there's really, there's no life, you know. Then people might have a few ornamental trees and a few ornamental shrubs. They may even have a veggie garden poked out in the back corner. But really there's, there's very, very little life. There's very little interaction. So for me, you know, what I do when I do a consultancy is, is I think we need to go in, and I think there's a great opportunity for everyone here if there's a designer, is to retrofit our houses to actually connect them to the outside world, um, because most houses are dysfunctional. Older houses are terrible, particularly in Australia. Um, but given that connection between the outside and the inside world, uh, with a beautiful outdoor space, ideally with that nice pond or no, dam effect, but put your tree systems in around your house so you're not having to deal with the hot sun or the cold winter wind, um, that you're inviting that winter sun in into that beautiful sheltered area where you can sit up and, um, and sunbathe. Like, um, but that, that, then tree systems are all productive, you know, or they all have a function. So you, you're building this lifeboat around your human habitat. And for those people who follow... Um, Dr. Zach Bush's work, um, for me, he, he's blown my mind because he's, for me, he's the Elaine Ingham of the human body. Um, Elaine Ingham is a soil microbiologist uh, and he's sort of blown my mind about the value of a healthy environment around our houses. Um, you know, we know we've got so many toxins around in, in our environment. So let's, let's build these lifeboats, this sort of life shroud around where we live to actually fortify our bodies, our minds, our spirits, etc. Yeah, that's what I mean by lifeboat. Building that life shroud around where we live that actually supports us as well. That's uh, so huge. And it, it just breaks my heart to see these places where it's a dead landscape. And you know, the peach pole should just, you know, they're struggling for food, but they should be watching out for food falling on their head because it should be and could be so productive. It, yeah, it's, you know, it's about bringing this life around us that humans have done for a long time. We've been these stewards yes. of life. We've collected seeds, yeah. we've moved varieties around, and we just need to awaken those abilities within ourselves again. Yeah. Um, great. Absolutely, mate. And 
It's it's a beautiful life if we do that. Comfortable, Absolutely. rewarding, yeah. interacting. Mm. Yeah. Um, can you recommend a good text for beginners? Look, I think I, I think don't think you can go past um, Brad Lancaster's um, Water Harvesting for Drylands. I think he's got a really great urban rural watershed. You know, uh, and he he's got great foundations. It's a solid bit of text for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. Um, that's one of my favorites. And I would say Sepulcher's Desert or Paradise, I find yeah. super helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we're actually, for people that want to learn to do this, we've created a course all around training up people to engage in a profession like this. I just put the link in the chat here. It's our core course. So that would be another good resource for people uh, looking to start doing this. Um, have you ever had an experience with a client where they viewed your work as a large scale piece of art? I'm curious what possibilities or steps you yes. might see towards gaining visibility and celebration in the art world and in main, main, steward, main stewarding or mainstreaming. I mean, I'm not sure what the word is there. This work as a restorative fine art mainstreaming. I think they were. Oh, main. you're, you're speaking my language. Um, you know, I, I pride myself, I really pride myself on, on um, the blending the, earth, the earthworks into the landscape because you can make it fit so it's not angular and hard and square that it can actually blend in. If you look at behind Zach, you know, that's actually, that's beautiful. It's functional. It has function. Um, but it is beautiful to the human eye. And I, I, um, I sort of played around with for a while, uh, you know, what I do. And really what I do is I, um, I, I do create functional art. That's how I see my work. Um, I, I connect people, farms and communities to landscape. And, you know, then I go on to say, um, with uh, intelligent design and precise earthworks, no landscape needs to be thirsty. Now, Look, but it has to be done beautifully and it can be done beautifully, you know. You, and it is such a joy to be able to, when a client gives you a creative license. Okay, yep, right out. Now I can express. And now I can I can actually just jump on the machine and and I listen to me laser level, but I'm just jumping, but I'm creating, you know, I'm trying to get it to all fit and balance, to have nice proportions. You know, um, look at the old buildings of the world. They're all got balance, you know, they fit in the landscape and we can create our work to do the same on that same theme. So absolutely, it's functional art to me. Um, it, it has extreme value and it has, it is absolutely beautiful in my opinion, for me, what, what, what I feel. Not because I've done it, but because I feel it has beauty. And I think when it's done well, people see that beauty i know mm. in a lot of our projects the piece of earthworks that we did becomes a center of the farm or the community or the education demonstration center whatever it is it naturally becomes a center point because it's so beautiful if you know i always aim for making something look like it was there naturally like it wasn't human built at all yes. it just fits so well that it just blends in and i gotta say you know I really got to thank Sep too, because every time, you know, it's easy to draw a straight dam on a map because it's the quickest, it's the easiest form. It, you know, you don't have to deal with a curved key or anything, but he would just verbally slap me across the face every time and said, don't you ever make a dam like that? <laughs> I will disown you because we want these features to not just be functional, but also be so beautiful that they draw people beautiful. in, that people feel a kinship a reverence and a desire to protect and work with these features yeah that's very very powerful man yeah um yeah i've never heard that one but that's that's great and i, I really really gel to that thinking because it's exactly what i want is people to be able to interact and enjoy and ah uh, just go wow this is beautiful yeah. exactly exactly that's the goal right just to have people in love with the features we're creating yeah 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 
Um, someone asked, where can we see a good example of a typical mainframe design online? Ah, uh, well, look, uh, I mean, possibly I've got some stuff on my website, Doc Spice Permaculture. Um, but just just think of think of you know if you think of mainframe, think water access structures. That's how I see it. You know, water dictates where your access goes because if you're going to force your access over the top, uh, you know, before water, you're going to have problems. And then really, access should dictate where your structures go. And then from that, it's just if you're thinking of a permaculture context, zones and sectors, you know. But once you've got that mainframe, it all has a relationship to water, water and access. Because yeah. if you don't have access, you're not going to interact with it, you know. Yeah. Um, you, you, if you've got pastures, you still need to walk animals to, to a point to graze um, or harvest trees, you know, the products of trees. So, yeah, that basic mainframe is a theme of water access structures. That's how I see it. I totally agree. I think you got to start with the water and build up. And once you get mm. that water layer inappropriately, yeah. it becomes pretty logical from that point. Everything kind of just falls into place because that sets your access, that sets your structures. And if you do the water layer wrong, you're going to be fighting it forever. <laughs> and it's just yeah. not going to work out more often than not. Um, yes. no, it's, it's absolutely critical to start with water. And as I said, that dictates your access and um, your structure position because it all it all designs itself from that because you put that theme uh, and that theme has a relationship to water, which water is life. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with the base element. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, how do you go about or work around building a water harvesting body if you encounter a site with sandy soils? Um, well, I suppose you could, you know, we've got to put a grade on it if you want to harvest water. Um, why can't you put a gra gradient road? You know, road base it. Not well. Put a put a gravel clay gravel road base on it. That's going to run water. You know, if it is sandy, uh, you're going to have problems with your access anyway because it's going to work up. Um, so put some road base on it. Um, or wood chip it. Do your work and wood chip it. Yeah. You can get hold of wood chips. Often wood chips, are, when they do the power lines in factory, they can be a free resource. You, you only need a, a blanket of wood chips to stop any erosion if your work's done on a, on a passive theme. Yeah. Yeah. Wood chips yeah. are a great asset. Definitely. I think it's important to recognize too that for not all landscapes is a water body appropriate, depending on your geology and the different things you're working yeah. with. And not all water bodies need to be a year round water body. Sometimes an infiltration yep. basin is the best thing you can do for that environment. Um, so it's, you know, we are constantly talking about this being adaptable and flexible. That's one of those things that you have to be ready to adapt and flex to. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, do you have any broad ideas for working with volcanic soil? Um, for example, should you try and store water in dams and ponds? Do gradient roads work to move water? Do they need to be on a steeper gradient than clay soils? Uh, are you talking about sort of basalt soils, volcanic? That's yeah. Soils? That's the piece I was going to respond to with here. There's huge variation within volcanic soils. There can be volcanic soils that are clay, ones that are sandy. Um, I feel like there's a, a wide range of soils that fall under volcanic soils, so it's a little bit hard to answer that question well. Certainly with basalt soils from, uh, from my experience in Australia here that, yeah, it, 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 um, it's very porous. Uh, you do have troubles uh, getting dams to seal and often you will have to add uh, bentonite or some, some additive to to get it to seal, yeah. Unless you've got a spring above it, uh, then it seems to be continued to hold. Um, but, you know, if you start at the top and impound that water and work down, you, who knows what actually is gonna happen down lower because you might get some springage happening, yeah. Absolutely, that's something we see a lot too. I remember um, someone asked for 
Dave's email, or sorry, Dave's website. I'm dropping that into the chat right now for everybody. So hit Dave up, get him to work, make sure he's uh, busy, help support <laughs> his efforts. Uh, he's got plenty already, so don't, yeah. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, I think you really got to, it, it's just another piece that you got to flex to um, as far as those volcanic soils. There's such variation within them. Um, yeah. I think maybe erosion's a thing, you know, spillways are um, are critical, you know, if we are going to do gradient roads. One of the issues I would say about gradient roads is um, I, I think you need to drop it into some sort of level or, or silt trap or something because you are carrying sediments because you have put a fall on it. So to drop it into a, into a dam like what I'm finding is really probably should pull up 20 metres short or something like like that, level it out, create some deposition system so the water can stop, drop its what it's carrying, and then overflow into a dam or something like that. So, mm. yeah, that's a great point, and definitely something I've been working in more and more as well, depending on the sediment loads. Um, and that kind of leads into this next question comments on good design for pond outlets. Um, how about culverts or water passing over the road? Uh, I, I call culverts shotguns. Um, well, they are because they they take the water from above the road and then they concentrate it into a point and then boom. So you know, they've caused so much problems. Uh, so wherever possible, I, I would advise clients to um, not use pipes in dams. Um, yes, you can have it as a as a crossing or as like to bleed water off. But generally, I always put a, like a rock causeway, which becomes your level, your spillway. That's what I would rather see. And if you have to do pipes, then you need to set up some spillway. So when that pipe's at full capacity or just off full capacity, your emergency spillway kicks in. So yeah, use them, but just account that, that sometime water is going to be, that pipe's going to be full. Um, so water needs somewhere else to go, but also what happens to that water when it comes out of that pipe full? Because it's going to come out like a gun and you need to, to do some rock armory or something like that to protect lower down. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I really try and avoid them at all costs because it's just such an easy fail point. That's, you know, if you have that as your only spillway, that is where the pond's going to fail someday. It might be a really long time, but it is going to fail there eventually. Um, so I always say the same exact thing. You've got to have an overland spillway, at least as an yeah. emergency spillway. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, your yeah. work is really just at risk of any big storm. Yep, yeah, indeed. Um, we're getting to the end of the questions here, uh, which is great. We're cruising through these. Um, any thoughts on the subject of dams putting too much pressure on the water lens and causing salt to come to the surface downstream? Well, I, I, if it's a dam that's construct, constructed to hold water, then it shouldn't because yeah. you're creating a dam to hold water. You're, create, you're compacting the clay as a, as a bowl in a sense. So I, I could see that, you know, creating structures to feed water into a dam may, um, but yeah, I can't say a dam would. Yeah, I, I found the same thing. And even in places where, you know, I've heard a lot of people raise concerns in places where evaporation exceeds precipitation, talking about salt buildup in the water, um, but well-designed water bodies that are fit into the landscape, I haven't actually ever seen that be an issue because it's not just the water hitting the water body, it's the water from the whole landscape feeding into that. Um, and so it, I just, I think it's a, valid, a valid concern, but, um, something that doesn't actually seem to happen more often than not. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, what would be your take in a situation where there's excess water? Um, I have a piece of land, one hectare, that is very shallow slope and the bottom is very soggy. The locals I bought the land from told me that the water table is very high. 
should I look at this situation, convert the problem, too much water on the land into an opportunity? Would creating a pond drain the water from the area into one point? Yeah, well, look, you could certainly create a pond um, and you have to think what you're going to do with that material that you pull out if it is that flat. Um, but I don't, I don't have a problem with draining landscape if you can drain it um, and plug it up in dry times. So you can have a, have a drain, uh, the classic sort of diversion drain, you know, a fall of one four hundred, um, and you can just put some rock across it, and uh, in the dry in dry times to actually hold water and step it. So you know you can put a swivel pipe in to, to drain it. So yeah, I you know I depends on exam depends on what you want to do. Do you actually want to crop it? Are you going to try to grow a product off it? Well, then if you are, um, then and if it's not going to be aquatic species, then you need to put some sort of drainage into it. Um, yeah, but it can be beautiful as well. You can do beautiful work still, doing drainage. Uh, and I yeah. think for me, this is part of where, you know, really being in touch and relationship with that landscape. Mm. You think of, uh, you know, Australia and California have lost 95% of their wetlands in the last 100 years, is a figure I've heard for each we're actively converting all of these wetlands into croplands, which removes their feature as this shock absorber. Yeah. Um, so I think in many of these cases too, we need to find other things to cultivate, other ways to work yep. with land so that we're not just yeah. constantly draining the few remaining of mm. the wetlands that we have. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, certainly with that one hectare, there's no reason why you couldn't create a pond out of the material that you pull out, you can create actually uh, a, uh, a path or a high area that you can actually plant trees on. So you can do something elegant with it, absolutely. And that's a great point. I often say in situations like this, you're concentrating the wet and concentrating the dry. Mm. So instead of mm. this mm. soggy swamp, now you have perennial water in some areas and you have dry yep. arable land in others. And, you're you're still balancing the water, but you're getting yep. production out of each of these areas yeah. instead of no production. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're getting to two hours. I think we're at a great point to wrap up here. We got through all the questions, which is awesome. You guys have been as an audience have been fantastic. Um, Want to really thank you, David, for being on here, sharing your wisdom, sharing your knowledge. It's been really fun to chat it up with you. Um, really looking forward to getting to interact and work together more. Do you have some closing thoughts, some things for people to follow up on? If people want to learn more from you, where do they go? Um, give the people some, yeah, maybe some closing thoughts and how they find you. If they want to work with you, how do they contact you? Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, the website's up there. So, you know, Give me, send me an email or, or give me a call. That's fine. I think, uh, I think the biggest thing is just get out there and have a go. You know, if you want to pursue this path, careful about what you dream because it can come true. And if you want to, you've got to bite off more than you can chew and chew like hell. You know, we've, we've got to be brave in this world because we've got to step out of our comfort zones and actually make this stuff happen. Um, and that's what I think me and Zach have done. We've just gone, well, that's what we want to do. And we I consider ourselves pretty lucky, really. You know, we, we get to be creative. And, and unfortunately, we don't, you know, we can't do much be creative in life much, particularly on a big scale. Um, so just have a go at it. Don't be, don't be scared of getting a few blisters. Um, and uh, just yeah, put a bit of effort in, you know, like put a dream the dream. Have a crack at it. Start small, just make small mistakes, okay? Build your confidence up. Get the, the, the comprehension of surveying. Get that down pat. Once you have that down pat, then you, then you can really jump out in scale of what you do, you know. Um, it gives you the confidence because you know, you know the heights are right, okay? You know it is. Now I've done work where I've gone, I've done work and I've come back and I've gone, ah, that doesn't look like, yeah, hang on, what's going on? Check it, 
Okay. Okay. But can you send me a photo with water in it? Because then I really know, you know. Um, so it's hard. It's hard to trust technology sometimes, um, but it's a great tool. Um, and it's, it gives us guidance of how we act. Okay. It's very simple what we do. You know, I, I say to people, I actually was talking to a, a student who was coming to a course and he was a dry, plumber and drainer for 20 odd years. I said, so you can do drainage? He said, yeah. I said, everything I do just has a relationship to one height. You either excavate below that height or build up above that height. He's like, ah, oh, I got it. I'm off. Oh, great. Done me, done me job. So off you go. You know, don't be scared to have a crack at things. And look, if you get stuck, if you, I'm happy to give advice to people or a bit of mentoring. That's fine. We need more of us. Um, so let, let's let's get going because we can create a pretty beautiful paradise in this world. Um, yeah, and have fun doing it. Oh, that was fantastic. That's a perfect way to close this. Thanks so much, David, for sharing your knowledge, Pleasure, your wisdom, man. your expertise with everyone here. We really appreciate everything you're doing, guiding the way for us as we really work together to help heal the earth. I just love that bite off more than you can chew and chew like hell. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And it's definitely what I did. And for those of you out there ready to start this as your own profession or career, you know, don't be scared to get the blisters. It might even be some bloody hands sometimes. <laughs> All of that is going to build into your skills and experience as a practitioner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pleasure. Been been great to talk to you, Zach. And you know, I um I love your work and what you're doing with Water Stories, mate. Is is fantastic. So good on you guys. Oh, thank you. We we love your work and are happy to support it in any way we can. And um, yeah, really appreciate you coming and sharing with the community here. I know in the comments here, everyone appreciated it a whole bunch. All good. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful evening, morning, day, wherever you are. Uh, and we will catch you on the next Water Stories webinar.